welcome back to Game of Goons, and we've got another new board game for you called Mysterium. Today I'll teach you how to play both the ghost and the player. I'll also teach you the setup of the game. So let's get started. Welcome to Mysterium. So the first thing I want to do is the setup. So typically the ghost does this. They find their, their little screen. You grab or sort the paths between the people, the psychics, the location and the weapons, uh, indicated by the blue marked card of numbers. And you do the same for the player side. Uh, for people, location, weapons. And as you can see, they're indicated by the brown sided cards. What you want to do is shuffle the pile. Um, they've already been shuffled for the purpose of this video, but you'd shuffle them and then lay them out face down for the game you're playing. So we're playing a four player game. Uh, we're putting on easy, so you deal six cards face down. As you can see, there's numbers on these cards. 18, 17, 16, 8, 7, 6. There's also numbers on the ghost version. So you find the same numbers. Once the numbers are found, you pick them up, you give them a shuffle, and you place them in the order of the player. So you take them out at random. We've got a yellow player, so that one goes in there. We've got a white player. We've got a blue player. And we've got a black player. You then flip over the cards on here. And that gives the psychics. This allows each individual player to have their own solution of people, location and weapon. You do the same for the locations, for example, and you do the same for the weapons. Rather than this on screen, I will prepare as can be now set up. Each player has a killer, a location, and a weapon. Killer is for the second player, for the third player, and for the fourth player. The ghost has these tokens here, uh, which are very useful to indicate who's been given clues and who hasn't. Uh, they can be flipped, or as the game recommends, pulled away and pushed in so you know who's been given a clue for that round. Obviously for the players it's a little bit different and for the players their idea is to guess the killer, their location and the weapon before this clock reaches seven rounds. The way they do this is by getting clues from the mute ghost, which are hidden behind this screen. Playing the ghost. The ghost has this deck here called the vision deck, and they've got to try and convey to the players who their respective killer location and weapon is. They have a set of seven vision cards revealed to themselves, um, and they must always keep seven cards in their hand. They also have crow tokens, so if they can't find some sort of logic uh, to link the, the killers or the, the psychics to the cards, they can swap cards by spending the crow token and discarding and redrawing any number up to seven. Um, I want to keep this one for the policeman. The rest aren't too helpful for me.
So they get discarded at the bottom of the pile and you draw another six cards to replace the cards that were taken. One more. The ghost each turn must give a player a single clue. So they can give them more than one clue. So they can give them multiple vision cards. Um, they can give them one vision card, two vision cards, three vision cards, but each round they must give them one vision card. So policeman here. So the clue for white is going to be arrows because there's bullets on this psychic card. It's not really bullets, but it's ammunition. So as a single clue, that will go to the white player. So once the ghost has given out the respective clues, for instance, given this player one card, this player one card, this player's given two cards, um, and this player only one card. Obviously the ghost is normally hidden behind the screen and cannot talk for the game. They can't even make a gesture. Um, I put these tokens here to indicate the respective player's actual solution. These tokens won't be here normally. Um, and it'll be up to the player to use the clues they've been given to guess their respective culprit. Once the clues are given, there is a timer which can be started. Once that runs out, all players must make their guess. Um, but they can freely communicate and cooperate. So this guy hasn't got a clue. He thinks it looks quite regal. And he's going to guess. There's also a lot of antiques and paintings, but he's run away from something, so he's not too sure. Um, he's going to randomly guess and um, place it on the archaeologist here. The second player thinks, or oh, they look like buttons, or they look like sweets. Mm. Crystalline look like sweets. He's going to move it onto the person here that looks like sweets, or I'll cook in there at least. This guy's been given two clues. Um, the ghost for is ammunition. You fire a slingshot, you fire a gun. So this guy is pretty certain that it's the policeman. So he places it there. This person's got a chariot. Um, very regal again. Uh, doesn't really un know what to go for and goes to the archaeologist also. Obviously, you know, one of them will be wrong. Players also get their buoyancy tokens. They can use that to vote on whether a person is correct. You can't vote on your own pawn. You can vote on other people's pawns. You can only vote once per pawn, but you can vote multiple times per turn. Please note, once you use a clairvoyancy token, they get discarded until the fourth round when you get them back. So blues voted. Them two, white doesn't want to vote. And he was blue. The decision has been made. The ghost then reveals who's correct and who is wrong. Policeman's correct. He goes forwards. These two are incorrect, they get moved back. It is possible for people to be on different stages of the game. As it's a cooperative game, you need every player to reach here before the seventh round. This will unlock the final stage of the game, which I'll explain shortly. As Blue voted, both of them were incorrect. His tokens get discarded and get placed on this clock. He does not get them back into the fourth round, but his clairvoyancy token goes up 
two points. This is important for the end stage, which gives you the amount of final clues that you will get. The people that succeeded discard their clues or give them back to the ghost. The people that did not succeed keep their clues, but will get given another clue or more this round. So the player has got an, an extra clue each from the ghost. Um, it's made things more confusing for them, but they're allowed to guess again. The other players will get clues for their location. The people that have moved forward and completed their objective take the card and they put it into their corresponding sleeve. This is done when each stage is guessed correctly, limiting the numbers of choices and allowing for the end stage to occur, which I'll explain now. If any psychic or player makes it to the end and still has time remaining on the clock, their clairvoyancy tracker goes up by the amount of rounds left. Black's only got two rounds left, so he just finished, he goes up. Clairvoyancy tracker by two points. So on the end stage, everyone takes the cards they have found out of the sleeve to give a person, a location, and a weapon. Uh, they flip their corresponding token to get a number. So this is done for all the players in the game, providing everyone in the previous rounds had made it here. The ghost then picks a combination of Killer's location and weapon, using these tokens here. He then places it face down without letting the psychic see it before the round starts. The ghost using his vision cards for the final stage of the game must select only three cards but each card must represent an element of the combination. For instance, one card has to represent the psychic, one card has to represent the location, and one card has to represent the weapon. So the ghost thinks, looking at these, these three are the closest. He's chosen number two. He thinks that's got a pan on it. So that clearly symbolizes the weapon. He chooses this one because he thinks the tape measure here looks like the tape measure. That kind of looks like a, a button or a brooch. And that clearly, well, in his mind, clearly symbolizes the killer. Uh, he hasn't got many other cards as a choice. He thinks that's the closest he can get to represent the hunting. He thinks woods, hunting in the woods. And hopefully that's enough for the psychics or the players to guess. The players get cards according to the clairvoyancy track. During the last stage of the game, players cannot communicate. For the first seven rounds, they can freely communicate. For the last stage, they cannot. So the player with the least amount of confluency gets only one card. So he gets this card. He then has to, using his clairvoyancy tracker, pick a number. Since that's the only card he's got, he sees a pan, pan weapon, it's the only link he can make. He therefore votes face down without letting the other players see. The black player, player playing the the player playing with the black token, it can get two cards. So he gets these two cards, makes his vote in secret. 
then the final players get to see all three cards, but they both make their vote in secret using the clairvoyancy trackers. The clairvoyancy trackers will then get revealed, and whatever the majority is determines whether the game is won or not. So you'll have a, a white token that says two, you might have a black token that says two, uh, a third one that says two, and the one that says one. If you flip it and it matches, you win the game. And that's how you play Mysterium. We'll be doing a playthrough of this, um, and it's much easier to see the gameplay in person during an actual game um, to get the idea of the thought process. But I hope you enjoyed. Remember to leave a like, subscribe if you are subscribe, click the bell button to get notified of upcoming videos. Keep up to date on our Facebook and Twitter pages. And we'll see you soon.